This is the Telegraph Cycling Podcast, supported by Jaguar. Today we remand. Where are we, Lionel? We're at uh, Mond. This is the airfield, I think, is it? This is the airfield? Yeah, we're at the top of the hill, over the top of the hill, at Mond Airfield. Been the big, been very hot again here today. A big plateau. It's a big plateau. Just at the, the the climb. If anyone's seen the stage, the riders climb the very steep, vicious three-kilometer-long climb, sweep round onto the airfield and uh, come around. And we've just witnessed Steve Cummings uh, win the stage for MTN Quebec. Um, I should say that my name is Richard Moore. I'm with Lionel Burney. Hello, Richard. And Daniel Freep. Hello. Um, and it's been a it's been another arduous day, another hot day. Um, riders suffering, and uh, some of the. Some of the journalists are suffering too, aren't they, aren't they, Daniel? Yeah, it's been a tricky day. It's been a bit of a jour sans, a bit of a défiance in the car today, wasn't there? Um, yeah, got a bit of heat exhaustion. And, um, it's ongoing. This is a, uh, a developing situation because the temperature has just gone up again and I'm starting to feel a little bit woozy again. We're ready to catch you if you fall. Uh, Roman Bardet, of course, suffered heat exhaustion the other day and bounced back and he was on the attack today. But so Daniel, you might be bouncing back tomorrow. It was it's quite ironic though because I when we came out of the car at the start this morning, baking heat, baking heat. Lionel and I were applying our factor fifty sun cream as we do every morning, and you were mocking us. You were mo- you were you were mocking us and and being really smug and superior with your sort of Mediterranean olive complexion. Um, but I have to say, half an hour or so later. Uh, the last laugh was on us, wasn't it, Lionel? Not that we were laughing. No, we certainly weren't. We were very sympathetic to Daniel's uh, needs. I brought back a lot of, lot of water and soft drinks, you know. Excellent. Daniel needs... I, I won't forget that. No, no, we need to replace, replace lost sugars. Um, so I think a revitalising can of cola drink uh, you know, revived him for a bit. But as you, as you say, it's not the big news story of the tour today, to be honest. But... Um, yeah, he's coming down a bit again. God, he's uh, declining before our eyes. Okay, this stage, this stage. Roman Bardet, well, there's, there's several talking points today, and we're going to get on to one of the main ones, if not the main one, which was uh, Chris Froome's allegation that a spectator threw urine at him. We'll be hearing in a moment from Chris Froome and from the stage winner Steve Cummings, as well as Brian Smith, Steve Cummings, general manager, MTN Quebec. But talk us through the last few kilometres of the stage, uh, Daniel. Or don't talk us through, I'll talk, I'll talk us through. But Roman, Bardet, uh, Roman Bardet attacked near the bottom of the climb. Young British rider Sammy Yates went with him. I thought he was riding very intelligently, but he was obviously digging very deep and he, he blew up. Um, Thibaut Pino, meanwhile, launched a counter-attack, got up to Roman Bardet. But Steve Cummings just rode a very intelligent race as well rode up at his own pace he's not as good a climber as those guys he knows that but he caught them over the over the top and uh, and beat them and and was it a Cummings victory or a French cock up I think a, a bit of both I mean not not so much a cock up but they just didn't have the legs did they Bardet and, and Pino and Cummings did say in his post race press conference that he wasn't entirely sure what the AG to our plan was because they had another rider in that break, uh, Jan Bakalance, and their tactics, in his view, didn't make a whole lot of sense. They don't get on though, do they, Bardi and Pino? Is there not a bit of needle between them? Um, no, I think they get on okay. They get on okay. I mean, there's obviously going to be some rivalry because they've both been hyped up as uh, the next French stage race sensation, um, and they've not had a particularly good tour. Neither of them. Um, I was on. A, I was on French radio last night. Richard Veronk. Everyone. Everyone remembers and, you know, still has a, a, a warm place in their heart for Richard Veronica, I'm sure. Um, anyway, um, I got into a bit of a spat with him about the French riders and I suggested that they're not... They haven't reached the level of maturity yet where they can be absolutely reliable year after year. You can't expect them to have the same tour that they had last year every year. They're just not at that point in their career yet. And they're still figuring things out. You know, Pino, for instance, in this tour has had a big problem with the heat. Um, and you know, generally in July it's quite hot. So if he's got a big problem with the heat, he's going to have to figure that out. He's a bit like me. You know, I'm going to have to go away, analyse what's happened on this tour, and come back with a different strategy. Um, but <laughs> get the data. <laughs> yeah. Well, exactly. At least it was good to see signs of life from from the French, and I'm sure those two in particular, Bardet and Pino, will ride very well in the Alps. Talking of strategy, we uh, yeah. stood in the shade of a, of a, of a large vehicle in, in a bid to protect Daniel. It's now reversed away, leaving us exposed to the sun. Let's find another spot, chaps. OK, we're, we're back um, behind another vehicle. Um, 
Steve Cummings, Lionel. You know him well. He came through the British system, but left Team Sky at the end of 2011, I think it was, to join BMC. Um, and he's always been a, a strong rider, but he seems to be having a very good season. Um, and, you know, I was saying to, to somebody earlier, he's probably one of 30, 40, 50 riders who you could pick out on the start sheet of the Tour who could possibly win a stage if all this, the, the planets aligned. And, and they aligned for him today, didn't they? Well, they did, yeah. I mean... Um Oh, it made me feel a little bit old because I remember covering the 1999 British Junior Road Race Championship somewhere in the Midlands, where, which Steve Cummings won, um, and then you know he got taken into the the British cycling system. I think later that year he rode the time trial in the World Championships, and if I'm not mistaken, I remember following in the team car. If I'm not mistaken, Fabian Cancellara overtook him, caught him for maybe two three minutes in that time trial in Verona. Um, but yeah, he's, he was part of the track um, squad for a long time, got on a silver medal at the Olympics in 2004 in the team pursuit, but never seemed to be sort of, he never seemed to quite fit in the, on the track. He's a track rider, he's very good at, at the team pursuit and he's done well in individual pursuits as well, but um, it, it, one of those riders that kind of falls between two stalls, he's got a lot of talent but he hasn't necessarily had all of the opportunities to um, use that talent and I think he didn't necessarily fit so well into the Team Sky system and, and a lot happier out of that and in BMC and I think now in MTN Quebec he's, he's found a team where he made the point in the press conference there that he knows he's going to get opportunities and they trust him to take opportunities um, or make the best of the opportunities and that is exactly what he did today. I mean, he got into that break and then he rode incredibly smartly all afternoon. He almost didn't notice that he was in there. He wasn't as visible. He was quite a lot often at the back. You know, this is the energy. first podcast we've even mentioned him in, which is almost unbelievable. But he's been he's been invisible. Yeah. Daniel, were you going to... No, Lionel mentioned his time at Team Sky. He was the least suitable rider for Team Sky because he, he's a, a free a free hitter he's a sort of number 10 you call me the number 10 of the podcast team the sort of fancy down he minces about and um, not doing a whole the yellow boots on yeah exactly um, pink or pink jeans he, and he's also actually he belongs to that car- um, category of riders that I call the mincers who spend a lot of time at the back of the peloton so there's Thomas Vocal is always there Ryder Hazardal Joaquin Rodriguez Thibaut Pino they love it at the back of the peloton not having too much stress so the worst thing you could do to Steve Cummings is telling me he has to ride on the front all day and he just likes lurking and, and his whole strategy in this Tour de France has been to lurk and mince for two weeks and he was always going to target these stages sorry Richard go I think as well that he he is prone to his his head going down a bit. He can become a little bit negative. Um, there was this famous story in 2010 where it was all going wrong for Team Sky, but they were being encouraged, told to attack every day, and it just what nothing was happening for them. Um, and you had two contrasting characters in the very upbeat, sunny, uh, permanently aggressive Juan Antonio Fletcher and Steve Cummings, who by the third week really had given up. And there's a story of him going to the, 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 the loo in the Team Sky bus and coming back and finding a post-it note on his chair from Juan Antonio Fletcher which read you will leave your balls on the mountain or you will not get back on this bus um, so anyway let's hear well, I think, well hang on now I think the significance of the day as well for MTN Quebec it's Mandela Day um, they had a, an inspirational kind of team talk this morning um, it was important to them on so many levels and I think as a, one of the wild card teams you know they've absolutely well they'd already justified their presence in the race with Daniel Teckleheim I'm not in the King of the Mountain jersey for so long. But, I mean, this really is uh, the, the icing sugar on the cherry on the cake. Really. Let's hear from Steve Cummings and then from Brian Smith, his general manager at MTN Quebec. Tour de France stage winner. Pretty good, yeah. It's been something I've been trying to work on for a while, but it's not easy to get the, the opportunity. So I have to really thank the team for bringing me here and uh, giving me the chance and letting me... Him, giving me like a sort of free, free roll in the first week to just get through and wait for these uh, stages, these kind of four or five stages now which we were targeting, which were good for me. So You grow up and it's a dream, I think, the Tour de France, especially these stages for me. And if I was ever going to win a stage, it was going to be from a breakaway like that. So uh, happy guy when I retire now, I think. <laughs> Steve, you, can you just tell us how you rode the, the climb? There were a lot of attacks, um, guys going off. Did you know the way you were going to ride that climb because it's a very steep very tough climb what was your sort of strategy going up there yeah I knew um, I did the climb before in Paris Nice in I think 2010 and uh, 
I, I knew it was really quite tough. I knew roughly it was around 10 minutes probably. Um, and my strategy was basically go as fast as I could go and ignore the attacks really. Uh, and it worked out really well. Uh, that was the best strategy. I, I didn't really think I could win to be honest because they're, they're a lot better climbers than me but maybe I just played it better than they played it. So We had a special meeting on the bus today. We had special helmets. Um, you know, it's a huge day in South Africa and uh, it was extra motivation. We wanted, we really wanted, we were due to get in the break and tried a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. Almost never happened and then, uh, yeah, it's great. We're going to have a party tonight, I think. You've been in some big teams, Steve. What's it like being part of this, this team? Oh, I'm really enjoying it, really relishing it. I mean, it's strange... Uh, like people say big teams but I honestly think that, that what, what we do in our, our team here is just as good as any any team we have a different strategy we, we want to be aggressive and we're racing for stages so uh, it kind of suits me really well because I can take it easy and stay out of the way on the days that aren't so good and uh, then the days that are good for me I can really sort of try and get stuck in I mean it doesn't always work but when it does it's really nice it was never in doubt really was it no, it wasn't. <laughs> one in 20. Oh, this was the Steve, we, one of the stages we planned for him. And, you know, the guys are tired so after yesterday. Even Ed Wald and these guys, they've, they've tried in the first, you know, half of this tour. And, you know, now we were starting to see some of the, the guys starting to feel tired, especially yesterday. It was such a hard day. We rode for Ed Wald. He struggled a bit in the, in the final. But today was always keep keep Steve calm, keep him calm and when he gets in a breakaway and I asked Ed Valde earlier on make sure he gets in that breakaway, he did, he tried twice, he got in the breakaway, 1 in 20 most teams would be on, you know wouldn't think that would be great especially with 3 age you 2 are uh, 3 uh, from say the you and 2 age you 2 are, and then you look at the names Uran, Bardet, Pino even Simon Yates, you think this finish and I was getting in, you know he came back to the car. I was in behind the peloton. He came back to the car and says, "You know, what do I do? What do I do?" And when I see seen the way the race was going, I said, "Look, just be patient. Just be really, really patient. It's going to be who's got the strongest legs in the final climb." He's he's a perfectionist. You know, he's an artist when it comes to these things. He knows I don't have to encourage him. We just let him race in the last 25 k's. He's not the sort of rider that you say. Come on, Steve, you can do it. You know, everybody else is looking weaker. Come on, come on, come on. Just leave him to it, and he'll deliver. And that's what we did. And I said to him, I said, look, over the top of the climb, Bardet and Pino started looking at each other. He went straight to the front, and I know he's one of the most aero pe- people on the bike. One, he gets in front, even two metres in front. There's no way they were coming back. And, you know, what a magnificent day, especially on Mandela Day. Yeah, I was about to say, I mean, it's not an African rider that won. But obviously, you're an African team, the first African team, proper African team to ride the Tour de France. How much does that mean to, oh. to you and some of the other guys in the team? It's huge. It's absolutely huge. When some of the guys, especially the African guys, they've really fought. Serge, even the Belgian, who's 24th at the start of today, they've really fought in this tour and, and delivered... You know, we, we came here with a stage one in mind to have a leader's jersey and to be prominent to come here and race. And I think we've done that already. And today, of all days, if I could wish for, you know, a stage one, it would have been this stage from any of the riders. You know, Steve's no different from everybody else. And, you know, just wanted to be in the race, but we could see we were missing things. There was a lot of tired legs. And in the last two days, I've never seen a, a peloton like it. They're coming out in ones and twos the whole time. And... There's a lot of tired legs, and we've been holding Steve back for this, and you know it's just top to day off. You told me earlier in the tour that it has been all about patience with Steve, hasn't it? He almost wrote off the first week or first ten days. He knew this was his period of the tour, didn't he? Of course he did. When everybody see Steve, every you know, Steve can go fast, but he's just he's. I'm not going to say he's a diesel. He's more than a diesel because. Once the pace settles, we're deep into the Tour de France now, once the pace settles, he comes into his own. And you look at when he won the stage of the Vuelta, gets himself in a breakaway, he comes into his own. Whenever, you know, in the first week when everybody's nervous, crashes, he's just sat at the back and everybody says, why is he sitting at the back? You know, get him in the breakaway today, I don't even care. I said in this morning's meeting, I don't care if it's 10, 15 riders, we get Steve in there, we'll get a chance. And he delivered. But the thing is with Steve, you can't pressurise him, you can't push him. He knows what he's doing. He just needs reassurance sometimes. And 
for this team to win in Mandela, Mandela Day, you know, the orange helmets were out there all, but they, to even, this was a, a boost. If he'd come away with a place, we've had a fourth place, fifth places, you know, you name it, we've been in the top ten. But to get a win here, it's just raised, you know, the confidence in the team now. And hopefully we'll get through tomorrow into the rest day and then we've got plans for the rest of the tour. We're not finished yet. Follow us on Twitter at cycling underscore podcast or on our website, thecyclingpodcast.com. So we heard there from Steve Cummings and Brian Smith, both absolutely jubilant and happy. Somebody less jubilant and happy was Chris Froome at the finish, who, who managed to, to not lose any time to Nari Quintana, who looked strong and active on, on the climb up to Mond. He, uh, I think Quintana's looking, looking better and better. You know, it's a small climb. It's perhaps not the perfect one for Quintana. He'll, he'll prefer the longer sort of passes in the, in the Alps. But he, the, the, the omens are looking better, I think, for, for the tour. Yeah, I spoke to his direct sportif at the finish, Jose Luis Arieta, who confirmed this is very much their strategy to uh, wait for the third week. And he pointed out that Quintana has always gone better in the third week than the two previous weeks in Grand Tours. But having said that, they acknowledge that Chris Froome has to regress or else uh, the, the pecking order is going to stay as it is because Froome has been stronger than Quintana up until now. Not only did he not lose time, Chris Froome, he actually gained one second on Naira Quintana on the final climb. The question is, uh, Froome has made more of these efforts over the course of the race so far. We're now two weeks in. Quintana has chosen his moments much more sparingly, and as Daniel says, if the plan is to come on strong in the final week, you just never know. Froome is, you know, he's going through the whole thing of leading the Tour de France. He's in the yellow jersey, he's got that spotlight on him all the time, he has to come and do the press every day. All of that adds up, and the cumulative factor of, uh, you know, being the, the, the stress of being the Tour de France leader... You know, they ha- that maybe will offer a chink of hope for Quintana. Right, well, listen, we also learned at the finish of a, a very unsavoury incident out on the road. Um, Chris Froome, I spoke to him in the mix zone after the race. We'll hear that interview in a moment. It follows our interview last night with Richie Port, who I'd heard had been punched and, and obviously had a, a pro- an altercation with some spectators who accused him of being a doper as well. He gave us a very emotional interview uh, where he confirmed that those events had happened he was very unhappy about it and just also about the general level of abuse uh, that's being aimed at, at Team Sky we've played the interview without any comment um, it goes without saying really that it's absolutely abhorrent it's, it's, it's an awful thing that's happening um, Chris Froome made the point in his press conference that he blames irresponsible reporting and I have to say that I think he has a point um, we, I, we spoke about this the other day it's not, it's not you know calling all journalists irresponsible would be like calling all cyclists dopers that would be unfair but I think there has been some irresponsible reporting I'm talking about reporting based not on facts but on opinions um, or presenting uh, or opinions that are not founded in any facts um, I mentioned Pierre Ballast the other day I mentioned him again I think that the interview he gave for Liberation uh, on a subject about which he doesn't know a great deal he doesn't know a great deal about Chris Freeman he doesn't know a great deal about Team Sky um, was disgraceful and, 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 there, and there are others as well um, so to recap, or to cap, the alleged incident today on the stage, on the road. Oh, there goes President Hollande. Oh no, it's Team Sky. It's Chris Froome actually being given a police escort off, off, the, off the mountain. That's not that unusual. Um, but, you know, there has definitely been a bigger police presence around the team. Uh, there was a police officer at the entrance to the bus this morning. Um, and they're getting greater security. But yeah... Froome at the end of the stage said that a spectator had uh, poured urine on him. Now that allegation has been made before and it's sometimes difficult to know whether it's true or not. In this case he says that he saw the spectator peeing into a cup and throwing it over him and shouting dope at him. And so he was obviously upset by this and this is what he had to say after the stage. A great day for us on on the road in in terms of the racing. Uh, team did a fantastic job again brought me to the foot of the last climb in, in pole position um, but as you said yeah it was it was unfortunate what happened out on the road there a, a fan throwing urine at me and shouting dope at me at, while he did it that's uh, it's disgraceful there's no other way to put it it's certainly not in the name of sport and uh, it's a shame that a few individuals can can ruin it for everyone else. Is it affecting you, Chris? I mean, we spoke to Richie, uh, who obviously had some rough treatment the other day as well. Is it affecting you and is it affecting the team? 
Um, I think it's actually pulling us together as a unit even stronger. I mean, it, it feels as if we're, we're under siege a little bit. And um, as I said, though, it's, it's the minority of people doing it. Uh, Richie got punched the other day. Um, it's not on. It's not on. And, and of course, from, from my point of view, I, I don't blame the public. I blame some of the irresponsible reporting that, 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 that's been around the race. Obviously, the, that's where this whole notion of Team Sky is doping, you're doping, has come from. And it's, it's not on. We work extremely hard to do what we do, and uh, it's got absolutely nothing to do with doping. How about the climb, Chris? I mean, Quintana got little gaps, you brought, brought him back. Did, was that a painful effort, and do you think he's looking a little bit stronger? <laughs> um, I was riding very much within myself there. I knew how steep the climb was. I knew it was short. Um, I, I knew he wasn't going to get too far away from me if I just rode my own steady tempo up there. And my goal was just to, to get him back before the top of the climb, have a bit of a free ride to the line with him trying to take more time from the other contenders. So we're really into the guts of the race at this point. You are listening to the Telegraph Cycling Podcast, supported by Jaguar, with Richard Moore, Lino Bernie, and Daniel Frey. So we heard there from a, a very upset Chris Froome, Lionel. Yeah, I mean, the, the thing about the Tour de France and, and with the big crowds and road cycling in general is there's this, this incredibly fragile pact between the riders and the spectators. And in the main, you know, on unbarried bits of road, the requirement for the supporters, the spectators, is that they do not lay a hand on the riders. And in, in the past, we've seen people trying to give a, a helpful push on, on a rider's backside. We've, we've in the past seen riders being handed bottles that you know bottles of water that riders in you know in back in the day used to take and drink or pour over their heads that all stopped well they certainly stopped drinking it because of the possible risk of although Lionel I saw the other day Leopold Koenig uh, took a bottle of water from a spectator mm. on the mountain and drank it which I was quite surprised by yeah I mean I haven't seen I, you know I haven't been looking out for it but it's not something you see as regularly now because they might have a spiked water bottle somebody might put some amphetamines or something in a in a bottle and hand it to a rider i mean you know that's outlandish and a bit conspiracy theorist but this this relationship between the spectators and the riders is what the tour de france hinges on and and if that is going to break down which it, in the last few days it, it, there's a danger and particularly with chris Froome, he's in a very difficult position because he wants to speak out they want to speak out and tell people what is the, the treatment that they're being um, met with out on the road it's unacceptable even in you know very rare cases it's unacceptable we now had a couple of things in in as many days some people will, will think it's all part of a grander conspiracy and will question whether or not there was really urine in the cup and maybe it was warm water or whatever you know some people will even maybe question whether Richie Port got punched we can only take the riders at their word on on this but there is definitely a groundswell of uh, unpleasant you know, atmosphere around the race. And if riders are coming in and saying this is the kind of stuff that's happening to them out on the road, the real bind that Chris Froome's in is that he wants to say something, he wants to draw, uh, draw it all to a halt, but by saying what he said in the press conference this evening and, and sort of fanning the flames of it, there is also the risk that it just multiplies the behaviour and people think, oh, well, if that's going on, you know, not... It's a tiny minority, but it only takes one person to punch a rider and knock them off, and that's a huge incident, and, and, and then it changes the dynamic between the people on the roadside who, in the, almost all cases, are fantastic and are there to watch the sport, and, and the riders who will rightly start to fear for their safety, and they will call for every climb to be barriered from bottom to top, and they will you know, have even more security. So it's a, I think the tour is on a... I don't want to over-sensationalise this, but the tour is on a little bit of a no, yeah, fragile punch, point at the moment. Punch or worse, you know, let, let's, let's, yeah. let's imagine, you know, there, there are all sorts of possibilities of worse scenarios. I mean, the most famous previous incident of this was 1975 on the Puy de Dom, where Eddie Merckx was, was punched by a... Spectator, and I spoke to Lucien Van Imp about that incident. He wrote, he won that stage, and he said that at that time there was an awful lot of anti Merckx feeling in France. That the the French, he said, were very um, can't remember the word he used, prejudiced um, against against Merckx in particular, and, and the Belgians in general, and that having stones thrown at them was was routine. That was the only case he could remember of, of a rider being punched, but having stones thrown at them was apparently routine. So perhaps it's not. The, the, the entirely new thing that, it, that we imagine but of course the, the possibilities for um, awful things to happen are, are there 
the, the amazing thing, considering that 15 million people are said to watch the tour by the roadside, is it doesn't happen more often. And that is, I think, because, as you say, Lionel, the vast majority of people come out to watch this. I, I stood on Plata de Bay in 2004, and there was quite a lot of hostility there towards US Postal. It was all taken out on the team cars as they went up the mountain before the race. There was a lot of banging on the, on the roof and so on. But as soon as the riders appeared, people parted, and there was, a, there was an, an automatic respect there. Daniel, you're back. Yes, how much have I missed? What? You missed Chris Froome telling us about um, having a cup of urine thrown at him. Well, there were there were incidents involving Team Sky before, weren't there? On Le Semnor's last mountain stage of the 2013 tour, I think Rod. Well, El- no, no, no. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. On Semnor's, Rod Ellingworth, who's the race coach at Team Sky, I think his car. Well, he he was not apprehended, but he certainly heard some heckling out the window, and I think he stopped the car and had a little bit of a lively exchange with a French fan. I mean, I I don't think the problem is necessarily the proximity of the crowds to the to the riders. I don't think there's anything you can realistically do about that, or or nor, neither should we really want to do anything about that because it's what makes cycling unique. I think that the real problem here is the poisonous atmosphere that is developing around Team Sky and around the race in general, and um, you know a lot of sympathy. For Team Sky, certainly because they they've really tried to do a lot of things and they have not been able to silence this ill feeling and they've not really been able to put any kind of lid on it. And you know, people will say, well, that's because um, it continues because a the image of the Tour de France and the atmosphere around the Tour de France has been poisoned by the last ten years, the last fifteen years, or the last hundred years of doping, and it's just something that we have to wait out. Um, we we just have to accept this, not get too crazy about it, and 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 not being too impulsive in the way we react to it. Um, and people will also suggest that they are getting this much scrutiny because their performances are by per se suspicious I, I totally agree that there shouldn't be an overreaction it's a bit like the threat of terrorism isn't it yeah. the, the overreaction almost makes the, the problem worse and and you know far better to carry on as normal and trust to the the wisdom or decency of the of the crowd yeah which is why you know chris froome's sort of statement in the press conference it's it's dangerous in in that sense as i just said because you don't know there's a lot of journalists in there from a lot of different media mm. and will everyone treat that it's the same as as, the, as the, the power numbers and all of the speculation not everyone will treat this as responsibly as perhaps they should and so if it gets fanned up in certain segments of the media then certain segments of the fans see that as an you know and the whole thing snowballs i think it was an extremely dangerous statement to make uh, I, I totally understand why he made it he's obviously absolutely furious and we all would be furious in that situation but i suppose this is where someone has to step in from team sky yeah. and say chris unfortunately you have to uh, keep I, I it on that. i mean i felt with with richie port telling us what happened as well that by getting it out there um that overwhelming majority of of decent people who come to watch a bike race come to watch the best bike race in the world um it's a bit like the problem of racism in football when that became stigmatized it, there's a sort of element of self-policing in, in the crowd and if that that you know the vast majority of people in Alpe d'Huez for example will be there to watch the bike race and they would be absolutely appalled by the very idea of of of, of you know assaulting riders even abusing them and I think if if that minority if people if other people who are there can be aware that there's that minority they can they can help to stamp it out and obviously although Chris Froome said he recognised the gentleman who had thrown the gentleman urine, well the the individual the thug individual um, who had thrown the urine at him I I think it'd be pretty difficult to for Chris Froome to track him down but as you say Rich there is the the can be an element of, of self policing and. All it takes is for you know if you you're in a crowd and you see someone doing something like that, then you alert the police. There are plenty of police around the Tour de France, um, and that really is a solution to the problem, isn't it? You put them in a headlock. Um, in, interesting that Merckx incident in, in 1975. Merckx did identify the culprit. He went Nello back. Nello Breton. Nello Breton was his name. He went back down the mountain with the police and identified him, and he was charged with a, an offence. And Merckx went and attended the the hearing. Daniel knows this because he wrote the the cannibal. The, he was he was awarded one franc in, in damages, um, and uh, and I've been working on a series of articles based on this for Bicycling Magazine in the US. So I've been doing a little bit of research into this. It feels like a, a sort of bad bit of timing in a way, almost like a self fulfilling prophecy to be writing about this, talking about this, and 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 lo and behold, it's happened. And now, 
le pédaleur de charme, supported by British Eurosport. Okay, on a, on a lighter note, the British Eurosport Peddler de Charme Award. Now, there are a few um, nominations today. It's a lot for Steve Cummings, but he, he won the stage. I think he's been rewarded oh. enough. What? Oh, oh. You know, the, the, the winner is, um, is Mark Cavendish, um, who was nominated for... There was a moment, and he was at the back of the bunch, and uh, Richie Port was, had been fetching bottles, and he was on his way back, and he was kind of struggling to... To, to move up the line um, and Cam just dropped back a little bit and gave him a little push back up to the bunch wow who's presenting him with that then <laughs> <laughs> this is the moment you've been waiting for Daniel it's going to be your job to present Mark with his Peddler de Charme t-shirt don't let us down I think he'll stop short of drenching me with urine but the reaction might be the reaction is often fairly spicy isn't it I think he'd be quite no, pleased I think he'd be fine I think he'd be fine fine I think he'd no, be I mean, happy I think he'd be delighted I think he'd be thrilled not a lot else for him in the tour at this at this point. See how fickle I am. My my feeling on this has just swung. Might he win tomorrow? Ninety degrees in ten seconds. Um, could he win tomorrow? Yes, he could. This is last chance before Paris. So we'll, we'll we're not going to the start tomorrow. So it'll be your job. I mean, you might have to go up, if he wins. the you might have to go up on the podium, Daniel, and, and uh, <laughs> present him with it on the podium. We'll see. We'll ask Christian Prudhomme about that. I've got him seeing Prudy tomorrow morning. Yeah, for a kilometre zero upcoming. Oh, yeah. When they start again on Monday. Uh, listen, oh, sorry, don't don't sorry. have a conversation. Sorry, but. no. Uh, yeah, we need to talk about that. Whether he's seeing uh, Prudy tomorrow. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. So uh, a couple of things. Uh, we, we we don't yet know the full ins and outs of Eduardo Sepulveda's exclusion from the tour. Um, we perhaps ought to find out mm. and then insert a little bit. That we're waiting for the communique from the race jury on that to confirm. But I did I did my heart skipped a, a beat a little bit when some sanctions were handed out for vehicles following the tour press band 1179 which is a uh, press vehicle has been excluded from the tour for stages 13 and 14 and I had a horrible moment we're not we're not 1179 are we but because this morning coming out of Rodez I was sitting in the passenger seat of our right hand drive English Jaguar um, with my laptop open my phone in my hand and one foot up on the dashboard and a gendarme absolutely furious on a motorbike on a motorbike a gendarme came past absolutely furious his face couldn't have been angrier and he was pointing and pointing and telling me to put down the telephone portable and I was my hands were in the air and I it must have looked to him for a moment like I'd then just taken both hands off the off the steering wheel and was mocking him and driving along with my oh, knee. You, you then put the, the window down and started waving both hands out the window. <laughs> yeah. And the, the, it, I wasn't getting my message across terribly effectively, but fortunately he recognised that we were in a right-hand drive car and I wasn't driving whilst typing on the laptop and using a mobile phone. Luckily he didn't see my laptop, eh? It's a horrible predicament to be in when you get red-carded. We've been red-carded before, haven't we, Rich? But no, forgot, we haven't been red-carded. We were red-carded, but they forgot to suspend us to give us our automatic one-stage suspension. Well, let's, yeah, that was 2010, wasn't it? Um, maybe tell that story another, another time. So we'll come back with a well, the, the policeman. The policeman did then apologise. He, he gave a big smile and he apologised. He did, yeah. That was, so uh, uh, gendarme de charme today. I don't know who he was or where he's from, but, but thank you for that. Um, but we ought to find out what happened to uh, Sepulveda. The rumour is that he had broken his chain and uh, he was unable to locate his team car. Um, and so he got into the AG2R, a rival team's team car, he got into the AG2R team car and got a 100 metre lift up to his Breton it's session. Car, car doping. Very naive, isn't it, thinking that you can do the Tour de France in a car. I mean, I know it's from Argentina and we don't get many professional cyclists from there, but that is actually one of them earlier, Fletcher. That is unforgivable. Well, I mean, yeah. it's retro doping, isn't it? I mean, they used to jump on trains and things like that and get well, in cars. You know, when you've got Eugene Christophe fixing his forks with bellows and in a, in a forge on halfway up the tourmalet or at the bottom of the tourmalet I mean you know surely he could have contrived a way to go 100 metres up the road to where his team car was yeah anyway we, we should leave it there chaps let's uh, say good night and head off to our hotel and we'll be back tomorrow Kilometre Zero starts again on Monday so thanks again for listening and thank you Lionel thank you Richard thank you Daniel thank you for the best analysis discussions and interviews From the 2015 Tour de France, listen to the Telegraph Cycling Podcast, supported by Jaguar.